Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for those that haven't, if you would please uh, take your seats. Uh, again, we so appreciate you all gathering uh, on today's Peace Sunday. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time. We're certainly grateful for our special guests that we will come to momentarily. Uh, let me dispense with a few of the required acknowledgments uh, at the very onset. Again, we're grateful for uh, our city's mayor, Mayor Lee, uh, and his welcoming us uh, into the Northlight Court. Uh, again, we're also appreciative of our city officials that are here, uh, Chief Wendy Steele, our adult probation, Chief Sifferman, uh, juvenile probation, uh, Commander Orks, uh, Deputy Chief uh, Jim Dudley. Again, we appreciate uh, each of our city leaders being with us this morning. Uh, I am joined by uh, Pastor Joseph Bryan, who's the pastor of the Calvary Hill Community Church, as well as the state uh, coordinator and convener for the Rainbow Push Coalition. Good afternoon. What a pleasure it is to be here on Peace Sunday. St. Francis of Assisi, the patron saint of this great city, spoke in the words of a prayer, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. As we continue the remainder of this year, especially during the holiday season, we recognize the tensions and the uptick of violence is real, and I appreciate and applaud the faith communities as we've joined together as a unified force from all backgrounds, all creeds, all denominations, and all practices to speak very simply, peace on earth, and may this season be about peace. I commend Mayor Ed Lee and the work he has done this year as we have begun to address violence very proactively, and we are very grateful as a faith community to join with him as we resource ourselves and connect ourselves with those in the city who believe that our city can be a city of peace. As a convener for Rainbow Push Coalition, it's my honor to be able to have convened this gathering today at the behest of Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson, whose agenda this year has been about violence prevention, and I believe we as a city can represent that well as we have this day of peace. And with that said, we bring forth the Reverend Carolyn Ransom Scott with our opening prayer for this peace hour. Thank you, Reverend Bryant. Bow your hearts with me. A discussion on the importance of interfaith-based leadership on the city's violence prevention initiative, Interrupt, Predict, and Organize for a Safer San Francisco is where we're opening up in prayer. Isaiah 65, 24, and it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Mayor Ed Lee, you spoke briefly at the 15th annual Interfaith Thanksgiving Breakfast, and you asked calling out for help to figure out how do we get to our youth that are disenfranchised and not connected. You said you depended and asked for the help of clergy and the religious community. You said you asked because you and the civic leaders in the departments cannot do it alone. We are here to pray for that reason. You went on to say our future leaders inherit what we do and all we fail to do. At this breakfast, the response from Mrs. Rita Simmel of the San Francisco Interfaith Council was, Mr. Mayor, we will help. For the sake of health and safety and the peace of this city, the only city in this nation named after a saint, we come to pray this day. And we pray, O oh God, that you would disturb us, Lord, when we are too well pleased with ourselves because we have dreamed too little when we arrived safely, because we sailed too close to the shore. Disturb us, Lord, when with the abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the waters of life, having fallen in love with life. We have ceased to dream of eternity, and in our efforts to build a new earth, we have allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly to venture on wider seas where storms will show your mastery. 
where losing sight of land, we shall find the stars. We ask you to push back, O oh God, the horizons of our hopes and to push into the future new strength, courage, and hope that we give in love. God, we pray that you will be our eyes, watch us where we go, and help us to be wise in times and honest enough to say we don't know. Let this be our prayer as we go on our way. Lead us to a place, guide us with your grace to a place where we'll be safe, O oh God. Father, we pray and push back works of destruction and the spirits of destruction, and ask that you do lead us to a place and guide us with your grace. Give us faith so that we will all be safe in our homes, our schools, our workplace, as we seek measures and ways for working towards peace through this fine city, as we present ourselves as clergy, lamps, and salt in this world. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Scott. As Pastor Brian said, we're grateful for uh, the leadership of our city's mayor, who upon the uptick of violence uh, declared a, a set of strategies that he uh, wanted to do in order to bring together all segments and all sectors of our community, a city leadership certainly, but the nonprofit leadership, residents, as well as clergy. Uh, and so we're grateful for his leadership. And so it's my pleasure. Would you please welcome uh, our mayor, Ed Lee. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming today. And certainly my uh, uh, deep gratitude for Reverend Jackson for making uh, his very limited time available to us to share with us. And of course, Reverend Amos Brown, thank you for your busy schedule as well to be here. Uh, Reverend Pastor Bryant, thank you for being here as well. And uh, Mr. Pappas, uh, I know on behalf of the Interfaith Council, you've shared with me uh, the Interfaith Council's desire to work closely with all of us to reduce, if not eliminate, violence in our city. We have a ways to go. Um, I did not deliberately prepare a speech because it's not about speeches. Uh, I want to also continue to express my very strong personal sentiments about violence in our city and what we can and continue doing about it. Uh, many of you have heard uh, from me in the past several weeks uh, in various other uh, events where I've expressed that sentiment uh, before city agencies and before community leaders uh, that I was not satisfied about what we were doing to prevent violence that yes, uh, I did think about and talked with a lot of people across the country and other mayors about the stop and frisk program and was uh, admonished and advised that there could be a better direction uh, in the same effort of reducing violence in our city. And uh, you've often heard me say that even in the the reflection of the great success that our city is feeling uh, on the eve of having a major sports team win the World Series or now a football team that's become very successful and certainly a basketball team that desires to come here and create jobs and make strong commitments to our communities even in the face of all these technology companies that are coming here and helping us uplift our economy even within that success, you hear me talking about the people who aren't getting those jobs, the people who are making decisions every single day in our streets, in our community, and I will not be mincing words. It is in the Bayview. It is in the Visitation Valley. It is in the Mission, where their dispute resolution is at the end of a gun. And this is the way they're talking. This is the way they're dealing with each other, and then with anybody who attempts to interfere with that. You've heard me say, even with the success of all of our departments and everything that they're doing, I can't give a job to a dead youth, no matter what we do. And so 
I can have the best training programs. I can have a high number of jobs available. Eric McDonald and I can create 10,000 jobs in the summer. But if our youth are resolving their differences with the point of a gun or the end of a knife, those jobs are never going to be available to them. How do we interrupt that violence? I cannot put it all on our police department. They know that, and I know that. And we speak the truth to each other. I've never been speeching with the police. It's all about what really works out there and what are, can they do and how can they present themselves in the most humane way. I've had those discussions with our law enforcement agencies, whether it's Bill Sifferman or adult probation uh, with uh, Wendy Stills or our youth programs with Karen Roy and, and uh, Marie Sue and others who are running these youth programs or our police chief or our fire chief or any of the numerous other leaders. And they all know that they can have the best programs as well. But if the people who are doing the violence aren't reached, those programs are half-baked. They're not, they're not as good. I wouldn't throw them all out. But they're not good enough because people still live in fear. In our housing projects, wherever they may be in our housing developments, or in the rundown tenements that we still have that we will attempt to rebuild. And you know, you've heard me again. It's not about the brick and mortar. It's not about rebuilding the physical structures of that. We will do that. We have the money to do that. We have all the resources to do that. But it has been about Hope SF, about rebuilding lives and giving people hope first before we put the bricks and mortar in. Because if we don't have people believing that they have a nonviolent world in which they can live in, then it doesn't matter how many jobs we have, how many training programs we have, how many programs I fund or don't fund. It's all somewhat of a wasted disagreement. So I've been having these honest discussions with the religious leaders because I can't mince words when at night I get the text about another 22-year-old black male found dead with gunshot wounds every other night. Then it just, whatever you're doing, you ask yourself, does it make sense what I'm doing? Do I have my priorities right? So today, we asked that as many of the clergy attend today with the special opportunity with someone who I've admired the whole of my professional life, if not my whole life, Reverend Jackson has been an inspiration to me in everything that he has done. Uh, I grew up knowing who this man is and what he represented and the struggles he went through to have a national conversation in every major city. And he's going to tell you about other things that are going on, perhaps even worse than San Francisco or, or Oakland or San Jose. But I'm, I can't rest on the laws that we might be a little better in employment, we might be a little better not having that many homicides, we may not have as worst level of poverty as other places, but the reality is we lost a lot of our African American community in the last 10 or 20 years. We lost a redevelopment agency that gave a lot of promises. I'm trying to keep those promises. Um, but I've got to find more and better ways to interrupt the violence. And I want today to register a personal appeal to our religious leaders to help me do that, find ways. I suspect it's not about money. It's not about numbers of jobs. It's about who we talk with and who we relate to and how can we penetrate uh, barriers or vacuums where there's no conversations going on. How do we talk to kids who don't have a mother or father? Who are they talking with? How do we talk to their aunties or their grandparents or their brothers and sisters so we can tell them that we care and that get them into a conversation with us? How about putting down the guns? What is it that 
they need from us to assure them that we have a safe passage for them to be dealing with us. This is what's been on my mind, and uh, even though I uh, helped articulate this new program called IPO, Interrupt Violence, Predict Criminal Activity Before It Happens, but the most important part of that program is the O, because the O is the link between community and government. How do we organize between ourselves to build the trust and the confidence that we have some answers for people who are committing that violence out there? How do we do that? We have to organize even better in our communities, and I'm willing to spend as much time as it takes to do better. Uh, that's why today it ain't about the 49ers playing at, at Candlestick. It's about us being here because we're all concerned. I can see your faces here. You share that sentiment with me every time you hear about another homicide, another murder, another killing, another wasted life. And it isn't just the numbers. I care about every single one of them. I oftentimes just think if I had that 21-year-old in my office, if there was a space and time, I could talk to that person. What would we say to each other? Would we share our histories of our families or would we just look at each other and say there's nothing to talk about? That I do what I have to do to survive, you do what you have to do to survive. What is it that we can build a bridge? These are the things I'm struggling with. I wanted to let you know that. And I certainly am greatly appreciative to the Interfaith Council because you've been hearing this from me for a little bit now and we've got to get deeper. And uh, that's why uh, I am so pleased to join Reverend Jackson yet again in this city. We have been a city of hope for so many other cities throughout the country, but we also struggle ourselves. We have the same problems. Uh, and we've got to, I think, produce models that potentially have answers for everybody else. So uh, I will continue talking about this. It is part of who I am. It's the part of me that keeps me focused on what I have to do in this city. And just because we win a World Series and we have technology companies coming in, that will not allow me the rest. That is not something that I say makes me so happy. I'm happy if every community in the city experiences the hope that others have in the city. And you can't do that if you've got a lot of violence. So thank you very much for being here today, and I invite you to continue dialoguing with us and consider this yet another beginning of this effort that will continue on and on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, let me pause here uh, just before we bring up our next speaker and presenter um, to acknowledge uh, each of the members of clergy and faith leadership. So if you are here and you're a member, a part of clergy or faith leadership, if you would stand, please. That's it. Thank you so much. Again, the mayor has declared and is committed to engaging uh, the faith community uh, as a part of this set of strategies. And so with that, um, there, there aren't any uh, faith leaders in our community who stand larger than uh, our pastor of Third Baptist, uh, the president of the San Francisco chapter of the NAACP. Uh, and again, we're grateful for his continued leadership, not just in and around this issue, but in all issues facing our community of San Francisco. Please welcome Pastor Amos Brown. Mr. Eric McDonald, the moving spirit behind this initiative today, to all of the departmental leaders of the city and county of San Francisco gathered here,
to Reverend Michael Pappas, who serves as our Executive Director of the Interfaith Council, to the Reverend Mr. Joseph Bryant, pastor of Calvary Hill, and the chairperson of the Rainbow Push Coalition of this region. Mr. Mayor, ladies and gentlemen, I rise to present the keynote person to speak for this press conference. And I think I could best get at the task by doing what I did in elementary school. My teacher called on us invariably to do what they call show and tell. You don't talk about anything un unless you could first show something. It was back in September when I had the honor and privilege of being a delegate at the Democratic National Convention. And on that Monday preceding the convention, African-American faith leaders gathered at the historic Friendship Baptist Church of Charlotte, North Carolina. The guest preacher was Dr. Calvin Butts, pastor of the great Abyssinian Church of New York City where Adam Clayton Powell succeeded his father as pastor and was the first black from New York to serve in the U.S. Congress. and Got over 67 bills passed through Congress, including Title VII, Head Start, National Student Defense Loan Program, but that preacher, Dr. Butts, had lifted us to the seventh heaven with his oratory. And after the service was over, as I followed the platform party out into the foyer of that great cathedral there, I looked up and I beheld a beautiful quilt at the center of many other quilts that the quilting ministry of Friendship Church had put on display. And when I saw that quilt that caught my eye, I said to the pastor, Dr. Clifford Jones, I want that quilt. I want that quilt. Dr. Jones said, it's yours. When he took me to the car, limousine was there waiting for me. Before I closed the door, I looked at him again and I said, Dr. Jones, I want that quilt. He said, I told you, it's yours. I will have my secretary to mail it to you. Two weeks later, a package appeared in my office. My secretary, Perlow, said, there's a package here for you. Looked and saw that it was from Friendship Church, and I opened it, and lo and behold, there was my beautiful quilt. And when I opened it, the quilt that I was told was mine, had on top of it a bill for $800. 
And as I looked at that beautiful quilt that cost me $800, I said, there's a moral to this experience. Whatever you want in this life, you can't just talk about wanting it. You got to pay the price for it. I'm delighted to present my friend, the Reverend Dr. Jesse Lewis Jackson, whom I have known as a friend for 51 years. We've traveled around the world in Brazil, in Africa. We were there when Mr. Mandela was released from prison. We've gone before Congress. We've gone before great enemies even to plead for justice for all peoples. But I present to you a preacher of the gospel, a faith leader who knows that there is no lasting peace at all unless you pay the price for peace by working the things that make the peace in a community. <laughs> Jesse Jackson has been the needle. He has been the thread through the agency of Rainbow Push Coalition, pulling together all of these broken fabrics of society in order that we might hope for, look for, and look for eternally a better society in which we will be no more beset with bigotry, with xenophobia, homophobia, anti-Semitism, racism, classism, all of those isms that tear the very fabric of society. He has paid the price for freedom. He has paid the price for peace. He has paid the price for social betterment. I present to you a brother who knows how to pay the price for a beautiful quilt of peace in San Francisco with jobs, with quality education, with great opportunities and cultural celebration. I present to you none other than Jesse Lewis Jackson, the man of the hour, to speak to us on how we can pay the price for peace in this city. Amos, are you presenting me with the quilt? <laughs> I want my quilt. <laughs> I want my quilt. <laughs> I am delighted to be here with you today. So many years ago, I met Dr. King and I went to Minnesota, and Reverend Amos Brown was then pastoring in Minnesota before he was the snow chased him to San Francisco. And uh, he not only knew Dr. King and his father, but Dr. King once taught a class at Morehouse of seven students. Uh, Dr. Brown and Julian Vaughn were members of that class. So we knew him intimately across the years, really before the 55 boy caught up to his death. And so Pastor Brown brings a, a lineage of struggle to the table every time he speaks with tremendous moral authority. And even the stroke has not stopped him from striking and fighting with great power. A big hand for Pastor Brown. I want to thank Mayor Ed Lee for convening the family. For oftentimes we think of leading from the front, but often you lead from the center. He who has the power to, to convene the family, to look at a family crisis and to think it through and to figure it out. And, and if we can get out of our own self's way, we might can begin to find some solutions to a problem that is multifaceted. 
I want to thank Pastor Bryant, who is our spokesman here in the state, recommended appointed by Reverend Brown, because of his youth and zeal, his intelligence, his will to fight. He is a preacher, a pastor, a teacher, a musician, and a San Francisco giant fanatic. Stand up, Reverend, I only recognize you. Brother Montgomery, to all of you who are here today, this issue of violence is a complex and challenging one. No one need to be self-righteous about it, for there is no instant answer to the things all of us must do. I'm impressed with the idea of religious communities coming together but well, at least we should know that the issue today, peace is not the absence of noise, it's the presence of justice. Yeah. When there is no justice, there is no peace. And when there's poverty and pain, people cry out in search of a bomb in Gilead. We must offer that bomb. My greatest excitement is that we're here today as a multi-racial body of clergy persons. My pain is that those who need to hear the message are not here. We at best can reach out to those who are not here because it's not just a matter that can be solved with an enlightened church. The killing in Kansas City, a football player killed his wife and himself. Three of four NFL players today they carry a gun. Three or four NFL players today they carry a gun. The commentary about the basketball players was about the same. Today we're all somewhere sitting around watching San Francisco play Miami, excited about who will win that game. We're there by the tens of thousands who watch that game. Those role models on that field are not ministers. Those athletes have a role to play in diffusing this crisis affecting our culture. Those who do music and art, who attract us by the thousands, we pay to hear them sing, watch them perform. They must lift their art above decadence and inspire us for there is something blowing in the wind. They cannot recycle our worst fears. Our nation has become much too violent. We're the most violent nation on earth. We make the most guns and we shoot them. We make the most bombs and we drop them. In this state, the prison union is bigger than the teachers' union. We're building first-class jails and second-class schools. It seems not to stop this problem. But for the male to reach out and to convene the family is the first step in the right direction. But Mr. Mayor, at this, at this table must be disc jockeys, athletes, artists, and agencies, all those who impact upon our minds must find a place at this table. We spent about three trillion dollars on the war in Iraq, and it was the wrong target. We spent three trillion dollars off budget and the trillion dollar tax cut for the wealthiest Americans who took the money to the Cayman Islands onto a foreign country, not to America. Now we're paying the price with huge threats to all to Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, They're threatening the poor and the seniors. And that's violence. We must, number one, commit ourselves to revive the ban on assault weapons. We lost about 6,000 Americans in Iraq in 10 years. We lose 30 to 50,000 a year at home. 100,000 are injured who do not die. The highest single cost in most inner city is the emergency room of hospitals of those who were shot with AK-47s. 
Police cannot defend us from AK-47s. 25 of all police are shot by AK-47s. We have a lot of uproar over the killing in Syria, 9-11-12 in Benghazi. In 9-11-11, they shot an AK-47 in the White House, 800 yards away. We must revive the ban on these assault weapons. We cannot underestimate the impact of drugs on this, Drug, the subculture of drugs. We lost on our border about 50,000 Americans, mostly Mexicans, they're on our borders. And so we have this crisis, Mr. Mayor, of plants closing, one of the cheap labor markets, jobs leaving, drugs and guns coming. That requires a national effort by all of us. And while I work, reach out to you in San Francisco, those who may hear my voice, please stop the killing. Please stop drug flow. Please give peace a chance. In this instance, it means that the labor unions, trade unions, must open up, provide for many of our youth more trade skill training so they can lay a brick and not throw a brick. It means that parents at the early stages of our education must instill the value of strong minds. Strong minds break strong chains. No reason why 20,000 parents in San Francisco can't do six basic things before we develop a taste for violence. Take your child to school. Meet your child's teachers. Exchange home numbers. Turn the TV off three hours a night. Pick up report card every nine weeks and take your child to religious celebration once a week. Much of this violence is developed bottom up, not top down. Our mother just say something like, I'm gonna beat you, boy. I'm gonna beat you so the police won't have to do it one day. Yeah. It was their own way of saying, if we get some home training, if there's some home cultivation, it will be a big factor in the social order. And so there's a sense we must restore homes. Uh, but uh, unemployed parents don't do as good a job as parents with jobs. Uh, I'm all about welfare to work. But there are four steps involved in welfare to work. One, the parent must have daycare. If you leave the child without daycare, you call an unfit parent, you can be arrested. You need daycare, you need transportation, you need job training, and you need a job. You need those four steps. What gives you an advantage in San Francisco with Mayor Quam across the bay and Mayor Lee here, you have two leaders who care. We've had leaders in historically who block school doors. You don't have that here. We've had leaders who encourage violence. I, I once asked George Wallace, I went to see him on his uh, dying bed. I went to have prayer with George Wallace and I reached out to him and he responded was, please come visit me and we had prayer and talk. So as we talked, talked, I finally said, George, I said, why did you unleash the dogs and the horse on the marches that Sunday when they were trying to get the right to vote. He said, well, I, I thought you'd get around to that. I said, well, why did you do He said, well, I did march as a favor. I said, I don't understand. He said, if I had not let the horses kick them on this side of the bridge, the mob would have been even worse on the other side of the bridge. A Hobson's choice. It never occurred to him he should break up the mob, not stone the marches. We had that kind of insanity in high places. But we have, in the, in the case of the mayor of Oakland, the mayor of San Francisco, mayors who are more civil. And here's a case of a mayor reaching out, not a mayor pushing off. A mayor who's embracing and not finger pointing. And so we must do all of this together. I would urge you. Uh, in the challenging and closing days of this struggle as we move toward this season of high expectation and low resources, there will be a rise in anxiety. So many of us should be following Jesus to Christ and not Santa the Claus. Maybe we're looking for the wrong reason for the season. Uh, maybe there's a struggle of values in the, what matters the most. 
is your family being alive and, and you're going to church and not going to a funeral. Maybe, maybe we have a power that we must unleash. We have the power not to kill each other right now. We have the power not to shoot each other right now. The power not to consume drugs right now. We have the power to take our children to school right now. We're losing more money from average daily absenteeism than we're losing from city programs. We can, we can change school attendance right now. And those who go to school tend to stay. And those who stay tend to graduate. And so to make this really happen, we need parents and teachers and ministers and professors and athletes and politicians to put on the full court press. These are our children. We can salvage our children. We know where they are. We know who they are. We know they, can, they need targeted jobs and job training. But you got to learn math to get the high-tech jobs. Anybody that can learn both sides of a double-jacket album can learn math. So anybody that can learn both sides to a double-jacket the rap, 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 rap album can learn a foreign language and learn math. Our youth are wizards at using high-tech iPods, high-tech phone systems, high-tech. There's nothing we cannot do. So in our fight to make the city and the base safer, let's decide to choose life over death. Futures of funerals and hope over despair. I look forward to working with you with the Rainbow Coalition in the coming days. Why not let San Francisco, Bay Area, Oakland, why not let this be the place where we break down the cycle of violence? Why not make this the place? If Montgomery could do it for public accommodations, if Selma could do it for voting, why can't non San Francisco do it for nonviolence? Yes, Our choices are clear nonviolence or non existence. Don't mind Dr. King one day a year, follow him the whole year, and we'll have a safer, peace environment. So I wish to you that we not only have a, a happy holiday, well, let's work every Sunday, but then Sunday to Sunday in the quest to demilitarize our society, stop the violence, stop jobs out, guns and drugs in, let's choose another way. Thank you very much. If we could hold your attention just for a few more moments, uh, Reverend Jackson has to catch a flight, which is why he is rushing 
out, um, but if we could hold your attention just for a few moments, uh, we really would appreciate it. Michael Pappas from the San Francisco Interfaith Council is coming just to spend a couple of moments on the work of the clergy network, uh, and then we will close. Mr. Pappas. Hmm. I'm in the unenviable position of having to follow a national icon. But good people, I, I would indulge you for just a moment to hear a humble message. The theme of today's gathering peace is a prospect that we all pay, pray for. Ah, that was a... <laughs> but to get there will require the collective participation, efforts, resources, and resolve of all in our city. By engaging faith leaders to join him in the broader effort to end violence in San Francisco, Mayor Lee recognizes a precious resource that could be the effective key to realize our success on this issue. At the same time, he challenges us to respond to a moral obligation that is at the core of our mission as communities of faith. He also reminds us of our history. For there has been no civil rights or human rights movement in which the faith communities and its leaders have not been at the forefront. And I look at Dr. Brown and he is a living reminder of that truth. At the heart of civil rights movement in the years 1963 and 1964, before there was a San Francisco Interfaith Council, there was the San Francisco Conference on Religion, Race, and Social Concerns, which for 25 years was the prophetic voice of social justice in the city and county of San Francisco. It was that movement that gave birth to the San Francisco Interfaith Council, whose mission it is to bring people together of different faiths to celebrate our diverse spiritual and religious traditions, build understanding, and serve our city. It was a previous mayor that challenged the Interfaith Council to step up to the plate to respond to its moral responsibility to care for the homeless at a time of crisis spun out of control. And we did. For almost a quarter of a century, we've opened our congregation doors, fed and provided a warm and safe place for homeless men to sleep during the coldest and rainiest nights of the year. It's been this mayor and his predecessors who looked to what happened at Hurricane Katrina, saw the key role that congregation leaders, facilities, and congregants can play at the time of a disaster, and called upon us to be key stakeholders in the city's disaster preparedness equation. Friends, history proves that we possess the capacity to respond to crises because we have. Today, Mayor Lee invites us <clears throat> to the table both to pray as well as to roll up our sleeves and do our part to solve a systemic crisis that impacts us all. In the Christian tradition from which I come, we hear when one member <clears throat> of the body suffers, all suffer. In order to meet this daunting challenge, we will need to build upon the work already begun and engage the wisdom and support of so many other prophetic voices, those who have much to contribute. The tent is large and must be filled. With our collective resources, we will also need to seriously address the root causes of violence. What are those root causes? Education. And here I'm speaking of after-school services, adult education, skills development, 
GED services, and parent education. Another being employment. And here I'm speaking of jobs, job training, and job readiness. And finally, family services. And here I'm speaking of intervention, at-risk services, family counseling, reentry services, and victim services. Unless these root causes are made priorities and supported with the resources needed, our prayers will not be realized, nor will our success be attained. Common to all our faith traditions is the belief that the greatness of a civilization will ultimately be judged on how it cares for those who are most vulnerable. By each of us, each of us seriously doing our part to end violence in our city, I believe that we can show by our works the best of San Francisco values. Thank you. Thank you again. As Reverend Joe Caldwell comes to uh, render our closing prayer, let me again thank uh, our mayor uh, for, again, as Reverend Jackson said, calling the family together. Thank each of you for participating. I would remind us all that each of us have a role to play. So if you're part of the faith and clergy community, the mayor is calling you to join. If you're part of the nonprofit community in terms of leadership and service provision, the mayor is calling you to join. And obviously, if you're part of the city family, the mayor is calling for you to join. So again, thank you so much on behalf of our city and the opportunity we have to in fact prevent the violence that is occurring in our streets. Reverend Caldwell. Both the Jewish and Christian book of Jeremiah admonishes faith leaders to seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Will you join me in praying just that, according to your own tradition and your own way? You pray silently as I lead us in a time of communal prayer to close our service. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come praying your blessings upon our city leaders. We pray that they would have wisdom to solve pressing problems, the heart to do so much with compassion and the moral courage to do what is right regardless of personal sacrifice. Lord, we pray for our faith leaders. Give them the ability to cooperate toward the common good of our city without compromising the personal convictions that make them who they are. Father, we pray for the victims of violence in our city that you would provide comfort in the midst of their mourning. And Lord, we pray also for the perpetrators that, Lord, you would provide transformation and redemption that truly solves this problem. Father, we pray for the peace of a city that is so blessed with so much but still has great problems. Lend your strong arm in support of these efforts. Unite us, encourage us, strengthen us, protect us. Go with us, Lord. Bless this effort and bless our city as it undertakes it. For it's in your great and most powerful name that we pray. Amen. Thank you all for coming.